I'm an officer for Eckerd College SSDP, uh, Students for Sensible Drug Policy on campus. Uh, we're a chapter that is part of a group of hundreds of other SSDP chapters that advocates for sensible drug policies on our college campuses nationally and internationally. I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Greg Gerdeman, Assistant Professor of Biology here at Eckerd College. A little bit about Dr. Gerdeman. Dr. Gerdeman received a Bachelor of Science degree in Biochemistry and Molecular Biology from Center College and his PhD in Pharmacology from Vanderbilt University. Dr. Gerdeman is an internationally recognized expert on neurobiological targets of cannabis. His dissertation work investigated the actions of the cannabinoid receptors in the brain and in particular how the endocannabinoid system works to regulate excitatory synapses in a brain network called the basal ganglia. His studies earned multiple awards from the International Cannabinoid Research Society, and his scientific articles have been published in prestigious journals such as Nature Neuroscience, Trends in Neuroscience, and Neuropsychopharmacology. Articles Dr. Gerdman recently co-authored on the concept on Runner's High, showing that the body's natural endocannabinoid system is activated by endurance exercise, have been covered widely by the popular press, ranging from National Geographic to the New York Times to Men's Health. According to Google Scholar, his publications have been cited in the scientific literature over 1,600 times. He also has recently joined the inaugural, the inaugural editorial board of the newly formed International Journal of Medical Cannabinoids. At Eckerd College, he teaches courses in cell biology, human physiology, and neuroscience. Without further ado, it is my honor to present Dr. Greg Gerdeman. Thanks. Thank you for um, being here tonight. And uh, I think it's always an easy thing, the easiest place for me to start um, by saying that I didn't go to graduate school um, to study cannabis. Um, really, quite frankly, I wouldn't have known, in full disclosure, probably what cannabis was in 1995. I knew what marijuana was, or pot, or weed, but how many of you walking in today would recognize the term cannabis and marijuana as the same thing? Those, most everybody, and those numbers would be very different uh, in 1995 when I started graduate school because the dialogue around cannabis uh, has changed so radically in the last 20 years. Public policy, not so much, but the dialogue and public perception about it has changed a lot, and I hope to just tell a part of uh, a story there. So. Rather than going to graduate school to study cannabis, I went to graduate school to be a neuroscientist. I wanted to study the mind and the brain, this uh, complex thing right behind your forehead, the most complex structure that we know of in the universe. I wanted to know a little bit more about that. And, and I was moved by the kind of profound suffering that seems to be reserved for human beings who have serious neurological and psychiatric illness. So really, honestly, I think that I was, I am, um, much like a great many biomedical researchers, did I do that? No. That I know. I'm like a lot of biomedical researchers. I went to choose my uh, path in life uh, because I wanted to play a role in discovering treatments and maybe even cures for diseases and injuries of the brain. That's where I kind of came into that. So I went into a lab, starting graduate school, um, that studied neuroscience, that studied cellular and molecular mechanisms for learning and memory. How connections between brain cells that we call synapses rearrange themselves, how we think maybe they rearrange themselves. What's going on in this complex brain when you're learning, acquiring new behaviors? What's, uh, how does the brain accomplish the storage of these abstract things that we call facts, that we like to kind of pour into your head here at college? How does that work? Those are the kinds of things that motivated me. And early in that, 
process, I was sitting in a seminar. My first PhD dissertation proposal had just gotten scooped by somebody, published somebody at least 15 months ahead of me. And I was at a crossroads, and I attended a lecture by a gentleman named uh, Daniele Piomelli, a PhD researcher who um, was part of the discovery and was explaining the discovery of this molecule called anandamide, a chemical. Anybody in here heard of anandamide? Fewer hands. Um, I certainly hadn't, and I, I had the, I think, good fortune of being in the right time and place to start studying uh, anandamide as a molecule at a time when it was really uh, almost entirely unknown. Uh, Dr. Piumeli was presenting findings showing that this molecule was presented in the brain, and that took me on a big twist. And, I, and my, it really, 19 years later, here I am still talking about it. I'll tell you some about that. Um, and the thing is, to become an expert in anandamide, this molecule that explains how a lot of learning and memory works in the brain, I had to become an expert on marijuana. I had to write a grant to the federal government to say, I want to figure out how ma marijuana works in the brain to cause addiction and turns us into terribly depraved individuals, being a little hyperbolic, but it was slanted somewhat like that. So um, I'm going to cover a number of things here in this talk about the study of marijuana, and part of it includes changing paradigms, which includes, uh, in my path and in the public discourse, an, an embrace of the botanical name cannabis for the plant, because research in mar to study marijuana uh, has come to change a dialogue in a lot of ways. So I'm going to give what is really a brief background of a very long history of the story of uh, cannabinoid research, cannabis as medicine, and uh, di some discoveries, modest discoveries in, in an exploding field of what we call the endocannabinoid system, the body's own system that is influenced by uh, botanical cannabinoids. And so it's my story as told by a neurophysiologist, because that's me, and so I study neurons and electrical connections inside the brain. And in my rough part two uh, transition, I'll talk about how some of these discoveries have led to a lot of changing paradigms. Not only paradigms of how we view the plant, which is in large way, a large way a reclaiming of a paradigm that's kind of been lost, of cannabinoids as medicine, but also changing paradigms about how the brain and body work, um, emphasizing these endocannabinoids, anandamide being the first one discovered, as a system of homeostasis and well-being. I'm not glued to my computer, so I won't be. And this is the plant we're talking about. Some select images of the cannabis genus, several subspecies. The taxonomy of cannabis is an interesting and uh, not decisive thing, but it's generally considered there are three strains or subspecies of cannabis, uh, the sativas, the cannabis indica, and what is probably the ancestral sort of uh, uh, feral hemp plant cannabis ruderalis, following the, the nomenclature of Linnaeus, who gave us this woodcut. Now here's a picture of a, a sort of feral cannabis hemp stand in the mountains, Atlas Mountains of Morocco. The plant has been used for thousands of years. We've had a relationship human beings have with um, the cannabis genus for a long time. There are Stone Age archaeological sites with hemp cores uh, dating 10, 20,000 years ago. It was, there's good evidence that I won't review here that it's been used as a food source for a long time. Hemp seeds are a very nutritious food source. Rarely in nature do you find a plant that is a, a botanical substance that has three things going for it that can be used in fiber and material construction, a nutritious food, and as a pharmaceutical factory. And this is where the, the controversial, uh, shadowy past of cannabis comes into play because of its drug factory that it sits and it creates on its, the flowering tops of the female flowers primarily. These are some close-up pictures. Uh, many of these pictures come from my good friend and colleague, Dr. Ethan Russo, um, and I will try to give him credit as often as I can. Uh, the flowering tops of cannabis is where the drug action is. The buds, uh, sometimes called sensimia, meaning a flowering top without seeds, is um, covered with these structures called glandular trichomes, which um, give it a very stickiness. 
And these are our chemical storehouses. Um, what are the trichomes doing? Well, trichomes exist in lots of other plants. Uh, they are gland structures. In fact, this scanning electron micrograph isn't from cannabis at all. It's a picture from basil. But you've got cells at this stalk that secrete into this sac a bunch of different products. In the case of cannabis, a number of special, that is, particularly unique compounds in this plant called the cannabinoids that we've recognized now, for, for example, as delta-9 THC. Um, other trichomes in the plant world are just spines or something that may deter herbivory because ants can't crawl across this kind of thing, whether it's going to make them high or not. It just has a physical barrier. The cannabis plant is uh, wind pollinated, so why, why did it ever develop this stuff? Possibly these trichomes that get developed in the female plant prior to uh, pollination help to collect the wind, uh, the wind carried male pollen and make it available to the um, ovaries of the plant so that there can be uh, sexual reproduction. There are lots of different preparations that have existed um, for hundreds of years and still do, not hundreds, thousands of years, millennia really. For example, terms like bong that is prominently used in India, um, sifted hash or keef that comes, has been prominent in North Africa, hashish, charas. There's lots of different words to refer to this, and part of the reason I like to bring it into this talk, which is about science and history, is because there's been so much stigma about talking about these words, and uh, there shouldn't be. These various preparations have been used uh, as medicine for thousands of years, and in strains that have been uh, actively bred, selected for by human activity, for their biological activity in us, as human populations have spread across the globe, uh, for, uh, and, and really across dozens of cultures. Where does that come from? How do I know that? Um, just a little smattering of some interesting pieces about the use of cannabis as medicine in antiquity. This is a, an image also taken from one of the publications of Dr. Russo of the Ebers papyrus. Uh, this you may, it's from ancient Egypt. These are Egyptian hieroglyphics. It's dated around 1550 BC. It's not the earliest Egyptian writing, it's not the <coughs> earliest medical writing, but the Ebers papyrus is considered the oldest in fully intact medical document. It's about healing. And in Ebers papyrus, I am told that Egyptologists agree that this set of symbols refers to a, a word that's transliterated as shem shemet, and it, equals, it, it refers to the cannabis plant, which was present in Egypt at this time. It, and it describes using cannabis uh, topically as a poultice, as an herbal pack, specifically related to feminine pain as a, as a vaginal suppository, not something, actually this kind of has emerged on the cannabis scene in California, but regardless, this is, one, uh, this is one method that goes back a long, long way for relating to pain and inflammation. It is kind of curious that during debates around Florida's Amendment 2, last year, some of the things that get dismissed as flippant jokes to make fun of cannabis as medicines, people are going to use it for migraine and menstrual cramps, these insignificant sorts of things that people deal with. And those are some of the oldest methods or uses of these in history. Uh, I like to pull out, being a liberal arts professor, uh, a, a nice ancient Greek historian, uh, that being Herodotus of Halicarnassus, in his uh, book, The Histories, a very important book of Western uh, civilization, he's got a wonderful passage describing uh, a, a ritual of the ancient Scythians that were a Caucasian um, group of peoples. You can read it, but I like to read it because I love the sound of it. They take some hemp seed, creep into the tent, and throw the seed onto the hot stones. Once it begins to smoke, giving off a vapor unsurpassed by any vapor bath one could find in Greece. The Scythians enjoy it so much that they howl with pleasure. They've got kind of a sweat lodge cannabis thing going. Um, and. One, I point out here, why do I have this picture? I have this picture because the seed, this probably isn't a very good exact uh, definition, but 
because seeds aren't actually psychoactive um, in the cannabis plant, but some of the highest concentration of the trichomes are in the bracts of the plant that surround the seed. So this is really talking about, most likely, taking the flowering buds of the plant and putting it on a vapor bath. But I want to stand back for a second and tell you something that doesn't occur here. This passage occurs in a broader, interesting context, talking about how the Scythians use hemp as fiber and how it surpasses the finest flax that we have in the land. He's really glowing about this plant he's discovered on his journey. And in describing this ritual, this doesn't happen like on a Saturday night because it's a good thing to do. This is what the Scythians did when grieving someone who has died. That's what Herodotus is describing. So one can look at this out of context and I've seen it Actually, in that first lecture by Dr. Pumilli, he gave me this passage, it's the first place I saw it, and it comes across as, oh, they howl with pleasure. But I submit to you that we should ponder this as a possible role of cannabis as a medicine, because these are people in a close uh, uh, community that has lost someone, and this is a grieving ritual, and that's the only time they did it, according to an ancient historian. 450 BC, um, this is a long time ago, so the use of psychoactive strains of cannabis, not just fiber hemp, is, according to the written record, quite ancient. Here's some other record that's more archaeological in nature, that also comes uh, from work from, with Chinese colleagues, from my uh, colleague Dr. Ethan Russo. I'm taking you to an area in the uh, I'll, I'll mispronounce this, the Xinjiang Autonomous Region in northwestern China. This is about the most remote place in the world if you're talking about distance from a coastline. It is, it is high and dry, and that's probably why this discovery was made. There are these wonderful tombs from a race of people that were migrating through Asia. They're actually Aryan uh, peoples, and one of the tombs that was discovered is this thing. Uh, an individual who is considered to have had uh, quite a bit of status in the community based on the burial items with. He's thought to have been a magical figure, a shaman because of healing elements. Um, and he also had a gigantic vessel of two or three pounds of a green substance that looked an awful lot like cannabis and a very well-worn mortar and pestle where this person would have uh, ground that herb, and it was collected by, my, by Dr. Russo and brought back to labs in the UK and analyzed, and indeed, the, the exceptional dry, high-altitude environment of this tomb preserved for over 2,000 years a plant so clearly defined as cannabis that you can even see glandular trichomes, and they did a biochemical analysis with analytical chemistry methods and showed that indeed this has THC in it, rather the breakdown product of it, but this was a high THC strain. One can only guess at how high, but when people are now talking about saying 10, 15 percent, 20 percent THC is some sort of creation of the 1990s, it probably goes back at least 2,000 years. Here's another kind of cool uh, example that's fairly recent. Uh, this so-called Ice Princess was discovered in 1993, also in the Russian mountains, and made a lot of uh, headlines because of, for cultural importance. Preserved by ice, uh, she was very, very well preserved, 2,500 years old, and just last October, some doctors, Dr. Andrei Lechig, and I don't show him here, he's a Russian doctor, did MRI scans and found that she had breast cancer, and it's interesting to note that she also had um, a large satchel of cannabis that was right there with her uh, in the tomb. So it made a little bit of a splash of, was this an early breast cancer patient using cannabis? We don't know these kinds of things. I should pick up the pace a little bit with these antiquity examples, but they're very interesting to look at, and I think it's really important to address the public discourse that cannabis as medicine is not an old thing. Um, back to ancient, the Middle East, in ancient Assyria, around 3,000 years ago, uh, for, the Assyrians dominated the Middle East for around 1,000 years. And uh, quoting a paper by Dr. Rafa Meshulam, uh, he says that they left us a pharmaceutical legacy on hundreds of clay tablets, and cannabis is one of the major drugs. They used it uh, for a number of different things and gave it different names. One of them is called Ganzi Gunu. I emphasis is mine here the drug that takes away the mind. I bring that up because 
just as cannabis is used as medicine for a very long time, we shouldn't think that there hasn't been uh, controversy about its negative effects. In fact, a very early Chinese reference to cannabis talks about it as uh, preventing salinity in old age, but also causing madness, which is an interesting thing. When this, just this notion of takes away the mind from translated from an ancient language that nobody speaks anymore, I can't help but wonder, are they talking about this? <laughs> from our mid, um, 1930s, 1940s propaganda films, or are they talking about something like this, taking away the mind? Um, we can't really know, but I think it's important to know that the controversy and wrestling with what a psychoactive substance like this means to us and does to us is not new. So, as a little word that I have on cannabis as a, as a folkloric herbal medicine, let's hop to today's very prominent discussions and debates about uh, using cannabis as medicine and whether it should be legalized. These are things that get presented to me a lot as someone who's engaged in public policy conversation. So is it good medicine just because it goes from the ground? Hey, God made it, right? This is, uh, that's why herb is good medicine. Um, haven't we moved beyond that? Is the, is the modern medical retort? Don't we define medicine in better ways in the 21st century? Um, well, we do. Right? There are a lot of herbs that grow in the ground that aren't safe medicine, can be used medically, but can also kill you. Um, there are lots of things we used to use as medicine. I heard that in a debate I was involved with a doctor last fall. Just, and they're right, just because cannabis has been used as medicine, folklorically, um, that it goes back a long way, that it grows from the ground, is not a reason to say it's a better or a good medicine that should be used. But the cannabis plant, I submit to you, is exceptional because of its long history, because it has evolved with human selection along the way for millennia to mimic the endocannabinoid system. It's still evolving today with human selection to mimic the endocannabinoid system, which is in the body a master regulator of well-being, a regulator of homeostasis, which is what physiologists use to refer to balance in physiological systems. And so it's been used in medicine, not just in ancient antiquity, but let's top out, that's how it got to the Western world. Was it forgotten? No, cannabis has been used in Western medicine very prominently and until relatively very recently colleague Don Abrams, a neurologist at UC San Francisco, likes to say that cannabis has been used as medicine for a whole, whole lot longer than it has been forbidden as medicine. It was discovered by the West, uh, it's generally considered, by this gentleman, Dr. William B. O'Shaughnessy, a wonderful figure in medicine. If you're interested in studying somebody who's underappreciated, this guy is a brilliant Renaissance man of his time. He started, he was commissioned by the uh, in, in India, this is his faculty picture of, from the uh, Medical College of Calcutta, a woodprint that was of him doing his chemistry. He was a physician and a chemist, and he conducted experiments with what he called Indian hemp in the 1830s. Some of the most important ones were with tetanus. He doesn't know what tetanus is, right? You hear of it uh, causing like lockjaw. Tetanus causes muscle spasms, rigidity, ultimately death, because of paroxysms, we call it, where the diaphragm becomes so spastic that it is paralyzed. In the 1830s, the mortality rate, meaning the chances that you're going to die of contracting tetanus, was over 90%. Dr. O'Shaughnessy, therefore, turned some heads when he traded, I can't remember the exact number, it was under 10, but he treated eight or nine patients uh, with tetanus, and almost all of them survived. His success rate was something like 80 or 85 percent. And people in the, and the physicians in the UK paid attention. They started treating individuals with tetanus. This should be re-investigated uh, today. There are, if you and I get tetanus, we're okay. We can, go to the medic, we can go to the local hospital and get maintained on life support and allow the bacterial toxin to pass through our system and we'll be fine. But there are lots of rural places in the world that don't have that kind of life support and 
an herbal treatment that can be used to sustain them past that life-threatening stage should be considered with open eyes. He brought his uh, cannabis extract that he invented called Squire's Extract to the British Isles, and in the late 19th century, this formulation was, this is conjecture, I'm just being a little loose with the facts here, but I'm under the impression that this thing was in every doctor's medicine bag in London. It was very widely used. It was, it's been well, maybe you've come across that Queen Victoria was treated um, with, with people say that she used cannabis for migraine, it was Squire's extract given to her from her doctor. And as another little sort of clip on, on uh, O'Shaughnessy being an awesome guy, he also introduced saline uh, IV fluid replacement for malaria. It saved an unbelievable number of lives, because at this time, people didn't know how to replace fluids that were being drastically lost from malaria. They tried to pump your veins with water. Bad idea. If you're in my physiology class, we'll talk about this. Uh, they tried to put milk in the veins. Better, not so good. He gave, introduced the concept that we now call isotonic saline for fluid replacement. Um, so these are just some of his uh, numerous accomplishments. This gentleman is uh, Sir William Osler, who is widely considered the father of modern medicine, in part because of his ex extraordinarily influential text, Principles and Practice of Medicine. And on the topic of migraines in this book, he wrote, Cannabis Indica is the most satisfactory remedy. And you can bet that there were physicians paying attention to this. It, he was talking about not just his personal preferences. It was very popular. In the 1880s, there was actually a, an award posted um, in the UK for the chemist who could isolate the active constituent of the cannabis plant because the Bayer Company wanted to find it like they had discovered uh, morphine in opium. Um, and so this didn't just stay in Britain. In the modern American pharmacopoeia, there were numerous cannabis remedies. It was present in, in the majority of over-the-counter medications. Here's a few different examples of, uh, of companies like Johnson & Johnson, and uh, this is the Searle Company, that were using cannabis product containing products at Lilly, which became Eli Lilly. This is the more modern equivalent, uh, Marinol, a synthetic, semi-synthetic THC pill that's been prescribed uh, by doctors in the US since the late 70s for nausea related to chemotherapy. It's THC, it, its handle is a unique pathway to multiple benefits. I suggest it's really not that unique and it's really not that new, but it's a catchphrase. There's off, you can, one can just engage in interesting uh, pastime looking at all of these examples of now called antique cannabis in the United States pharmacopoeia, but I shouldn't dwell with that too much longer. <coughs> cannabis prescriptions were widespread in the United States prior to 1938. There were at least 2,000 prescription medicines in American pharmacies. So our, our grandparents and great-grandparents knew about this stuff. The FDA came along, the Food and Drug Administration, and was created in 1938. That's not strictly true. The FDA had a predecessor that started at the turn of the century that was more interested in monitoring food safety. But in 1938, the FDA obtained its sort of status. It took on a new role of quality testing and product, confirming what products say they're going to do, and, and, and regulating medicines in that way. Aspirin and morphine, two botanically derived products, were grandfathered in for FDA approval. They didn't have to go through the kinds of standardized clinical trials that drugs uh, gradually have had to since. Cannabis was not. Why not? It was more widely used than either morphine or aspirin. Because in 1937, and through the policy aspects, the federal government passed the Marijuana Tax Act. And while all of our great-grandparents, if they had any knowledge of what their physicians gave them, had heard of cannabis, probably, nobody had heard of marijuana. It wasn't a word that was used in the popular dialogue at all. It was kind of a Mexican-Portuguese slang word that was introduced in the conversation and nobody really knew. When, it was, when the 1937 Marijuana Tax Act was brought before Congress, 
The only people who opposed it were the representatives of the American Medical Association who said, this is being brought forward on the American public and you are outlawing a medicine with great potential and with great use already recognized and it's a mistake. So cannabis was criminalized under a totally new name, marijuana. And I really like this cartoon. This is something I, I get from a, a fellow, Mr. Tommy Lee, who's a Master of Public Health student at Florida Atlantic University. He's got a great slideshow and he's given me some of these slides. He found this one. I like this one a lot from the Pacific Drug Review in 1937, right when the Tax Act was passing. Suddenly the cannabis concoction is called marijuana and it's kind of this drug fiend looking character getting smacked out. You might not be able to read this. This says druggist. The title is called The Proper Treatment for Mary. And not insignificantly at the corner is the federal inspector dressed all dapper like a proper G-man of the day. Making sure this is going on, I think. And the interesting thing is the federal inspectors meeting with the Treasury Department may, very, I don't know this, but they may very well have written this cartoon because that's the kind of thing, and this isn't a conspiracy theory, this is the kind of thing that they were engaged in to spread uh, the idea. And I'm not even going to read this out loud, but I'm going to let you look at it for a second because it is part of the equation. It is part of the basis upon which cannabis policy is based. This is uh, Mr. Harry Anslinger, who is the, sec uh, the director of the Treasury. Is that right? No, he was Federal in the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. He was in the Fed. He was directed the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, which was sort of the predecessor to the DEA under the Treasury. I knew he wasn't director of Treasury, but these are things he said quite openly in the halls of Congress. I really, particularly like the notion that. Their satanic music, jazz, and swing result from marijuana use. This is testimony to Congress that had more impact than the representative, at least by the vote, by the representative from the American Medical Association. And it's not something that we should forget as ancient history because this is the foundation of what drug policy related to cannabis became. And there was all kinds of pulp fiction Many of, much of it written by employees of Harry Anslinger to feed into the federal psych, uh, the, uh, the national psyche about this. Well, research continued, and I'll breeze through this. A compound called cannabidiol was identified by a fellow named Adams at the University of Chicago. It wasn't the chemical structure wasn't known, but they had an extract that had activity, and they started doing tests with it, and they showed that it stopped muscle convulsions in rats. Uh, Davis and Ramsey showed that it was useful in the treatment of seizures for epileptic children. I'm sorry, this is THC, which actually was just a synthetic THC. I won't go into that chemistry background, because it wasn't until 1964 when methods of NMR techniques were really available that Dr. Rafi Meshulam in, uh, in, at Hebrew University and his colleagues Gaioni and others um, discovered the chemical structure of what we call, consider the primary cannabinoid compounds. Cannabinoid meaning they come from the cannabis plant and really from nowhere else. Delta 9, THC, and cannabidiol. These are the two major constituents. They're the ones that are talked about all the time um, in discussions about herbal cannabis as medicine. Here's a timeline I've constructed of sort of major discoveries since then. In 64, Gaoni and Meshulam isolated Delta 9 THC from hash extracts. He's got a wonderful story about how he acquired that from the Israeli officials bringing in brickloads of hash. Um, in the 1980s, uh, the group of Billy Martin and other researchers at Virginia Commonwealth University created animal tests that were used to characterize really quantitatively what, what THC does. And the importance for this kind of audience to tell you that is that it was used to develop synthetic drugs. So because of this behavioral test, synthetic drugs based on the structure of THC were used. And they became very useful because people started sticking little tags on them, little radioactive tags that you can use to investigate where they act in the brain. And it was discovered that THC binds to really specific spots in the brain that we call cannabinoid receptors. And now we're into really recent history, in the 1990s. 
why does the brain have specific receptors, specific molecules that receive THC? Well, is it because we evolved to be marijuana users? Um, probably not. We have an endogenous system that acts like THC called the endocannabinoids. In 92, nanamide was discovered as the first one. Some graphical image, some data of what this kind of thing looks like to show you that these receptors that we call the CB1 cannabinoid receptors are the most abundant receptors of their type in the entire human brain. They may be, some of you know that all drugs and hormones and neurotransmitters work at receptors inside cells. The ones that bind to THC and the endocannabinoids may be the most abundantly expressed receptors in the entire human brain. This is a modern image with a drug that is a I, it, it looks much like THC, but it's labeled to light up in a PET scan, and that's what this image is, showing all the areas in the brain, which is pretty much all of them, that express the cannabinoid receptor. The only areas in the brain, maybe not only, but the most conspicuous areas in the human brain that don't express the CB1 cannabinoid receptor, that aren't activated by THC, are areas in the brain stem that control your heartbeat and your breathing. If you look for receptors for opiates, for example, you'd see them all over the brainstem. That's why if you take too many opiates, like Oxycontin or morphine or heroin, your brainstem will just shut down the breathing and the heartbeat, and you die of respiratory depression. You, these receptors are kind of the most conspicuous place that the cannabinoid, uh, these brain areas, that the cannabinoid receptors aren't, and it's why you can't really overdose to death with cannabinoid compounds. It's never been documented. You need some sort of a high-speed vehicle or a death wish to die from overdosing on cannabinoid drugs. The cannabinoid receptors are not just in the brain. They're throughout the body as well. These, this is a whole body brain scan from this journal, a journal of nuclear medicine, with an earlier tracer molecule based on THC, showing it's really high in the brain, really high in the liver, really high in the immune system of the gut. The, the cannabinoid receptors are expressed widely in the brain, where we call them CB1 receptors, and in the immune system, where they, where they were called CB2 receptors, just from their order of discovery. Brain and immune system, uh, highly regulated, by the cannabinoids. And again, were we hardwired to respond to molecules only in cannabis? No. We were hardwired to respond to molecules that we've evolved with all along, that every animal on the planet possibly has, the endocannabinoids, a name that comes from endogenous, meaning internal, cannabinoids. Just like endorphins are a contraction of endogenous morphine, endocannabinoids are like the endogenous THC-like molecules. This is the paper describing anandamide, again by Raphael Mishulam. This guy is amazing. He discovered THC, the, the structure he solved the prize in 1964, and his lab discovered anandamide and the subsequent, many subsequent discoveries many years later. These are, for chemical aficionados, uh, some structural depiction of the two primary endocannabinoid compounds in our body, what we call ligands, because they activate the receptor. AEA is anandamide, the first one discovered. 2-arachidonoglycerol, or 2-AG, is uh, the product, probably the most widespread endocannabinoid in the brain. These are very prominent and, and uh, widely discovered. Um, they're synthesized by cell membranes. Some of you who have chemistry backgrounds will see these as hydrocarbons. Polyunsaturated uh, hydro hydrocarbons, polyunsaturated fatty acids, I should say. They exist in cell membranes where they are just generated and released by the neurons, like the skin of the cells, just like releasing these messengers, in a manner of speaking. They're important for many different things. Here's a little snapshot. Neural pathways of reward, regulation of mood, emotion, resilience to stress, may be responsible to neurological states of well-being, like natural highs, natural joys. The study of these systems, the endocannabinoids and the receptors, have gotten to be so big, it's likely that they contribute a great deal to personality in each one of us. Um, so, oh, there's more animation here than I'd like. 
we've got this notion, just to sort of encapsulate it for you, that we've got body-derived endocannabinoids like an endamide, plant-derived cannabinoids like we call now phytocannabinoids, THC, uh, and lab-derived synthetic cannabinoids. I confess this is another slide I have adopted from uh, a colleague, Tommy Lee. I'm not sure what not CBD means. But they both, they all bind, depending on their pathway, they bind to the cannabinoid receptors in the body. And these discoveries have radically shifted the scientific discussion about cannabis. If you look for published articles on cannabis, this is uh, work compiled by my friend Dr. Sunil Agarwal, there's a big spike in 1972. These are like number of publications per year. Um, there seems to be no y-axis. There's a big burst here in 1972. And then in 1992, with the discovery of the endocannabinoids, you get this logarithmic growth of papers that are published looking at scientific articles looking at the cannabinoids. Why the big burst in 1972? Over the past 20 years, there's been two, an average of 2.3 publications per day on the cannabinoid systems. This is where I come into places where I'm going to try to interject a little bit more of my neuroscience, cellular neuroscience, because I came to school interested looking for how cells in the brain work. And this is what this slide is showing. A bunch of pictures, different depictions of cells in the brain. And classically, all of these things have in common but they're electrically cell active cells we call neurons. This is how your brain works. Electrically active cells called neurons receive some stimulus, sensory stimulus or the previous cell. They send an electrical signal down a long cable called an axon. They release a neurotransmitter at the next cell and the cycle rather continues. This is the kind of thing I was studying. How do synapses change with learning and memory at a real fine level? And one of the things I learned goes back 100 years to a fellow who's referred to as the father of neuroanatomy, uh, Dr. Santiago Ramon y Cajal, who won the Nobel Prize in 1904. And he set up what was called the Neuron Doctrine, describing with chem chemical stains that were just invented what the nervous system looked like. I, there's much I could say about this. But he described, he, he postulated, just by looking at static images, he was a real thinker, he postulated that the, that the brain was made of electrically conductive cells, that they were connected by gaps we now call synapses. He didn't use that word. And that uh, part of his doctrine, which has been sort of the closest thing we have to dogma in science, his idea was that the flow of information goes one way. That there's this flow from dendrite to cell body to axon to the next cell. And part of what... I walked into and helped to uh, describe is that the endocannabinoids kind of turn this on its head. Not extremely so, but the endocannabinoids don't go in the same way. They're released by cells and travel backwards to regulate the inputs that are coming into that cell. It's become widely studied. Endocannabinoids uh, are a system that, that are a major, are major target. And again, quoting Dr. Mishulam here, they apparently act in just about every system people have looked at. These kinds of reviews and praise on the endocannabinoid system are not in um, side stream sort of uh, scholarly journals. They're in the top journals in the world, like Science Magazine. Here are some vignettes that I've offered in a chapter that I wrote in, um, in this book, the pot book, edited by Julie Holland. Uh, Endocannabinoids, is my synthesis of a lot of research, are a key component of physiological homeostasis in many systems of the body. They are used by neurons to fine-tune their own synaptic inputs. If, you're, if a neuron, if a, if a brain area is receiving too much input, as you would get in a case of epilepsy, a case of seizure, where incoming neurons are firing too much, how does the target cell receiving all that input cope? In the normal healthy situation, it releases endocannabinoids, which travel backwards across the synapse and tone things down. That's how they work. And it's an important discovery that has been discovered in brain area and brain area and brain area. Therefore, it's called the endocannabinoids are referred to as an on-demand defense against excitotoxicity in the brain. They keep our brain from being too toxically overexcited. And 
Medicating with cannabis, one can certainly argue on scientific grounds, is like boosting the body's endocannabinoid system, which is a system that is associated with physiological health and well-being. This is a little personal uh, short observation. Part of our discovery in this, um, in this field is from using not only fancy chemicals, but fancy genetic models, modern, I should say, genetic models where animals have been genetically altered, for example, to not have the cannabinoid receptor. Hey, if this is so important, why do I know it's important to physiology and well-being? One of the reasons is because about 15 years ago, uh, researchers at NIH created a mouse that didn't have the CB1 cannabinoid receptor. It's lacking the gene. It's been disrupted. How does this mouse fare? One of my colleagues at NIH was actually working with these mice early on and was a little alarmed because the mice, the mice, he kept finding dead mice in the cage. The CB1 mice were dying. And it turned out the animal care facility, to make kind of a long and comical story short, not comical that they were dying, I don't mean that, but uh, the animal care facility at the NIH where they were housed was getting elevator work done. And the technicians were working on the elevator and keeping the door open so long that it kept blaring this alarm. And it was causing, it, my colleagues hypothesized, the mice to seize out and die, which is not something that mice normally do. This kind of thing was, um, was followed through in a more formal way by another group, not directly connected. Other people, if there's a good, right idea in science, other people are going to get to it. And this is another NIH group, Andreas Zimmer's group, who showed this knockout mice. Basically, have a, this is a survival curve. Age of weeks with mice, normal mice, CB1 expressing mice, can live out 24 weeks just fine. Animals that are lacking this receptor start to die. They live shorter, less, health, less healthy, more seizure-prone lives. And this has been confirmed by lots of different work. And again, I just want to touch on how widely covered this is in the field. It may seem a little pedantic, like, oh yeah, science is talking about endocannabinoids. But people don't realize that these are the, the, the largest, most prestigious journals. And for years, when they're covering the cannabinoid system, they talk about things like rescuing Parkinson's disease, stout guards of the central nervous system, the guards that are keeping things safe endocannabinoid signaling as a synaptic circuit breaker in neurological disease. When you have aberrant signaling in the nervous system related to neurological disease, endocannabinoids are there to put on the brakes and regulate the system. The endogenous cannabinoid system controls extinction of aversive memories. Here is work, and this has been published since 2002, showing in the best animal model we have for post-traumatic stress, that when animals learn to be very fearful of a stimulus, they have a tone, for example, that predicts a shock from a classic uh, conditioning, they, if they don't have the cannabinoid receptors, if they don't have endocannabinoids being released in a brain area called the amygdala, they can't get over it. Normal mice, if, you, if, if investigators shock them and they pair it to a tone, they will learn that when they hear the tone, they freeze up. They're worried something's going to happen. But if the shock doesn't come, they move past it. They have emotional resilience. It's not that they forget. It's that they actively relearn. That's what extinction of a memory is. It's not forgetting. It's actively reprogramming and relearning. And come to find out the release of endocannabinoids acting at cannabinoid receptors in our fear-sensing, emotionally resilient pathways of the brain are critical for this to happen. And this is what goes on. In many cases, with veterans who have post-traumatic stress, with battered women who have post-traumatic stress, with people who are suffering from experiencing emotional trauma that they shouldn't have had to experience. One has cues that you can't get past, and the endocannabinoid system is a natural system that normally helps you do that. Why wouldn't boosting that system help out? There are many people who say that it does. Again, not new. This is 15 years old, this really important preclinical work. How much clinical trials have been uh, taken to human beings on PTSD? Uh, kind of none. Um, let me 
I'm running, I'm running a bit short on time, but let me uh, discuss that part of the trouble. Why hasn't been something like a PTS uh, medication been put to human trials? Because it's important to have human trials. Partly because since the Controlled Substance Act of 1970, the federal government doesn't acknowledge any medical benefit. They schedule it under the DEA Schedule One that says there's no accepted medical use, none. There's a high potential for abuse, and there's a lack of accepted safety under medical supervision. My, I've, I've bled in, I'm, this isn't really a part one, part two, I've been bleeding in the endocannabinoid system all along, so I'm certainly not half over here. Um, but I've been, I want to shift to just emphasizing how the cannabinoid system has changed paradigms about how nervous and immune systems work. I'm not talking about the immune system, but I really could. Um, and that endocannabinoids are seen as a system of homeostasis and well-being that cannabinoid medicines tap into. Whether you're an advocate for botanical medicines or the new pharmaceutical drugs that I promise you every major pharma drug company is trying to develop to act like THC, they are drugs that can work to help maintain homeostasis and well-being in situations of deficit. A whole lot of animal research has taught us so much. I've touched on a good bit of it here, I mean, like some select pieces. But it'll always fall short for human use because testing as a cannabis as a medicine requires <coughs> testing cannabis in humans. Has it been done? Yes, it has. Some of you may not realize that marijuana has been an FDA-approved drug. Did you know that? Herbal cannabis is an FDA-approved drug? It is under an investigational new drug license that has been stopped, but it has been improved as an investigational new drug, and it wasn't stopped because it didn't work. That's kind of the, the, the punchline that's kind of hard to take. Here's some just pictures, some images of people who have been uh, at the forefront of this. Bob Randall, Elvi Masika got it uh, for glaucoma. She still gets this sent from the federal government. Or Rosenfeld in Florida has a complex tumor-forming disease. He receives these tins of rolled cannabis cigarettes uh, and smokes them in abundance, and he has maintained a very productive job as a uh, securities broker. Um, why is it so hard? Why hasn't it advanced? Well, that investigation on new drug program was canceled. I won't go into all the details, but it was. It wasn't because it didn't work, because really, though it was called an investigational program, the government never really put money into investigating whether it worked or not. Um, these patients swear by it and still use it, but it has been stopped. The cannabis plant, the botanical cannabinoids have been the single hardest drug to work with um, because of unique barriers to research in that the FDA and the Drug Enforcement Agent Agency are both required. Um, and that funding only comes from the National Institute on Drug Abuse. That's changing now. I'm not going to harp on this story because I've got optimism. A lot is changing. But for the past 20, 30 years, if you wanted to write a research proposal for cannabis as medicine and it wasn't pursuing the question of why it's bad for you, it's rejected out of hand because it's not night as pur purview to look at medicine. But yet they still generate Cannabis, they still grow it at a farm at the University of Mississippi. This is Dr. Mahmoud Asoli, who's run the program for many years. He's tending his crops, showing them. This is a big uh, container of the cannabis that's going to be rolled into cigarettes and sent to people like Irv Rosenfeld, who have been grandfathered into this investigation on new drug program. Now I get to the second part of my title, anyway, that Botanical cannabinoids are finding a way in mainstream medicine. These are images coming from a pharmaceutical company in the UK called GW Pharmaceuticals. Its founder and president, Dr. Jeffrey Guy. In the UK, uh, 15 years ago, when the government and the House of Lords commissioned a study to call upon prestigious scientists to analyze the database and answer the question, hey, is cannabis medicine or is it not? The experts came back like they have in the United States on at least three different occasions of federal commissions, and they said the same thing. Yes, it is likely to be medicine. There's good potential. It's pretty safe. Let's try it. In the United States, on those three different occasions, it's just been shelved. 
in Britain, they went forward with it. And uh, Dr. Guy and his company were, were well poised to take advantage of it. So this is a greenhouse that's been going for 20 years in the Salisbury Plain of the UK, growing a lot of cannabis for research. And this is their product that is now in clinical trials and approved for use for multiple sclerosis, spasticity associated with multiple sclerosis in many countries. And it's really going to be on the scene here a lot. Um, have there been trials in human patients? This is where I want to end because it's, after I say this, because it's important to people who are engaged in policy decisions, to physicians who want to know if there's gold standard research in humans that have been done. Yes, there have been. There have been like 11 very high quality clinical trials despite an obstruction a bureaucratic obstruction, obstruction to using this medicine that does not exist for anything else. I'll highlight just one, a pain trial by Don Abrams at San Francisco General Hospital. Smoked cannabis and HIV neuropathy. I like this kind of clinical work because you don't have to really read statistics or pull out a microscope to figure out the differences. The data are very clear. In an outpatient setting, some patients were given placebo cigarettes, some people were given cannabis. And you can actually make very low THC uh, placebos that they smoke. And here's the important part. In the inpatient intervention phase, when these people with very painful neuropathies, damage to their nerves from HIV, came in and medicated with smoked cannabis, their report of a, pain, a very standard, normalized, recognized pain scale showed that their pain decreased very significantly and maintained days of relief after the last uh, intervention, last smoking. This was published in a very good uh, medical journal. An offshoot of the same, uh, of a, a follow-up of that study also from the same group looked at spasticity, not pain, but spasticity in a neuropathy setting. This is a little bit more complicated, but it is, I bring it up because this is what's meant by the gold standard, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial. Patients don't know what they're getting. The physicians don't know what they're giving them. It's been blinded to them. And half the patients got placebo, half got cannabis. The ones that got cannabis reported reduction in spasticity. Then they got placebo, came back. Cannabis, placebo or before and after, rather. I've got that backwards. This is the placebo line. But these are before and after effects, and these drops are when they are treated with the cannabis. And then they switched groups. They totally switched, and the phenomenon switched. The people that were given placebo before were now given cannabis, and it worked. People that were given cannabis before were now given placebo, and it didn't work. This is the double-blind trial. This is what physicians want to see, and there needs to be much more of it. So, I need to wrap up here. Where are we in Florida? Where are we in the United States? Uh, and my sort of summarizing of this is like this. There's a massively changing tide of public opinion. Really, I mean, this was so instructive to me, so informative um, during the debate around a medical marijuana state constitutional amendment last year. The public debate wasn't really about cannabis as a legitimate, likely effective, certainly compassionate medicine. It wasn't there. And yet the stigma around the plant still ruled. I, it is worth saying that sort of the ghost of Harry Anslinger and the things he said, the ghost of Richard Nixon, and things that he recorded himself saying about Jews and hippies wanting cannabis to be legal, that stigma sets the tone of the conversation and not this wealth of modern scientific understanding. The arguments against Amendment 2 in, in uh, Florida weren't based in science or sound public health research. They totally revolved around stigmatizing marijuana users and then applying those stigmas to patients, caregivers, and doctors. The, the retort was this is not about medicine when it was entirely about medicine. Oh, this is something I shouldn't, I don't want to have this for you to read, really, but I wanted to make sure I ended on a positive note and I want to say this, that um, it isn't that cannabis use is old and has been there for a long time that makes it good medicine for today. It isn't just because it grows as a plant that God gave us. The historical use of cannabis is vastly richer than other medicines that Euro-colonial uh, physicians used to use. 
The migration and evolution of cannabis across millennia has been a story of human populations cherishing its value, selecting its traits as agriculturalists, and maintaining or adapting its use across numerous cultural transitions. The sheer breadth of its sustained historical use as medicine, which I can tell you, most present day physicians and politicians know literally next to nothing about. This isn't taught in medical schools yet gives great credence to its safety and the perception of its value to patients. In turn, much of the folkloric use, from antiquity to more recent times, is, I believe, validated by a large degree, to a large degree, by the wealth of modern research into cannabinoid medicine, and understanding that the endocannabinoid system is a key in the homeostasis of many, and possibly all, physiological systems in the human. So there's my conclusion, and thank you very much for your attention.